Okay, so this our other favorite Megan, and I think honestly the better Megan, if we're being honest here, Megan McArdle. There is a high cost to making drugs more affordable for Americans. So, like now, I know, like well, you, you pay, pays one hundred and twenty dollars for an eighth once. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's true. Like, if people had access to medicines, some of them might not uh, die early, and those people might end up being school shooters, Hitler. or Hitler, or something. Mm-hmm. So, you know. That's a cost that yeah. you have to consider. So, I mean, Megan is here to tell you that, like, yes, it's become, we, as a public, we've become increasingly aware of the sort of ludicrous and, you know, like blackmail basically involved in the drug companies can now charge $700 for insulin or something like that. And that there's a growing dawn. Something that's been synthesized for almost 100 years. And that, you know, that they, that, that they abuse making. patent laws to like keep yeah. these things from being like, you know, public domain, uh, yeah. you know, basically in perpetuity. And, you know, you may think that that's bad. And Megan's saying, you know, you, you may be right, but like on the other hand, what are the costs of fixing that? You know, it could be higher than you actually dying from diabetes. What if they what if they try to make insulin generic and then they forget how to make it? I mean, you're telling me when you go to the supermarket, you want that shitty cereal that's in a bag. What if you start getting prescription drugs that are like, you know, a knockoff of Prozac? Yeah, you don't want to go into Trader's Joe and get your (laughs) get your prep. Okay, Megan McArdle. Americans outrage about prescription drug prices is odd in a way. What beautiful opening sentence. Drugs account. Uh, I, I love a nice declarative, clear statement of intent to begin any article. I like. I, I always like to begin an argument being like, "Hey guys, I don't know about this thing." Well, as as you're aware, the most infuriating part about Megan McArdle and her writing slash thinking style is um, essentially laundering her hard right wing point of view through obscene twee affectations and absurd hemming and hawing where you go on the one hand, on the other hand, yeah. and you make it seem like you're being a fair, giving a fair-minded representation. Yeah, just give me Ayn Rand over this show. Yeah, oh, yeah, no, she, Ayn Rand knew what she believed in yeah. and would say that you're a worm if you think otherwise. It's like she, if, if Megan Mc, McArdle wrote that shit, it would be like, uh, A kind of equals A, I think, maybe. <laughs> but one could see Who's a scenario John where it equals B. Who yeah. is John Gall? I don't know. People are kind of saying who he, he's a guy. He's but is he? Is, I don't know. I mean, he might be a guy. It's I, fun. It's, I kind of think he's a guy. But it's weird. Knows? Okay. Drugs. This is, this is McArdle again. Drugs account for less than 10% of the nation's overall healthcare spending. And while the price of some medicines has spiked, Overall, spending on prescription drugs has grown more slowly than broader, broader healthcare expenditures. Woo-hoo! Oh, oh, woo! All right. We did it. Got back, folks. We What's that it. about people literally dying because they're rationing their, their insulin like on the regular? No, but like. The, but there could be more. For, you know, she, what she's saying is like, it's odd that you care so much about how expensive prescription drugs are costing because th- the cost of prescription drugs has actually grown far slower and less dramatically than the cost of everything else associated with health care. Which is exploding. <laughs> so he goes, uh, in 2017, the increase didn't even keep up with inflation. Oh, my God. Yet polls mean, show. I guess all those people aren't dead. Yet polls show that pharmaceutical companies are one of the most hated private what sector the industries heck? below it's the weird. rest of the healthcare care industry don't get it. it's like and this, below even lawyers. What the heck? It's like this company where they say, hey, I need this thing to not die. And then they say five Can million dollars. It? And, and literally, you say no. if, if you can't afford it, we won't give it to you. It's weird people resent that co- that industry. How can you not like somebody who is weighing two things in two hands? One of them is like, you know, will thousands of people die because we just gouged the price on something we didn't invent? And on the other hand is like his kid going to the new school's new mime academy. <laughs> How can you hate that person? This is a part of Felix's like, yeah. ongoing war against New York's The New School. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, look. I just think it's emblematic of the type of person. Everyone uh, everyone at The New School, their dad is all Martin Shkreli. It's a long story. <laughs> so he goes, uh, she goes, that's why it's been such fertile territory for Democratic presidential candidate Senator Bernie Sanders, who in April introduced a bill to control prescription drug prices and last week tweeted that once in the White House, he would lower the outrageously high price of prescription drugs. This idea, the idea has proven so popular that even Republicans, including Senator Rick Scott, are getting into the act. Rick Scott, by the way, if he's getting in on the act, he must have figured out a way that he can um, s- steal millions <laughs> from Medicare recipients yeah, Rick directly. Scott, Rick Scott is going to be the first senator sponsored by Big Baller Brand. <laughs> he's a big baller. Uh, which isn't really surprising at all. Is it, Megan? 
Drugs may be a small part of our healthcare spending, but it's the cost that we're most directly exposed to month after month. More so it's o- a big part. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> moreover, idiot. moreover, it's easy to directly compare U.S. prices with much lower prices in, say, Canada. Yeah, another comparable, uh, like, industrialized first world nation that's literally <laughs> we share a border with that is in every way it's like America. That, like, for some reason, their drugs cost a like a fraction of what we do, and then the people literally organize caravans to go north of the border to get fucking drugs. Megan, honestly, Megan would like to build a wall, but on the Canadian yes, border, so Americans can't, drugs out of can't you know, steal prescription drugs from Canada. So he goes, um, Americans think the difference is unfair because it is. And yet Americans arguably get a pretty good deal from all this overspending. What they get? New drugs. <laughs> okay. Can you like that shit for like make your eye, eye, uh, eyelids just thicker? So like goes, that? <laughs> new drugs. We get new drugs. The oversized profits that pharmace- okay, different here we go. types of boner pill. The oversized profits that pharmaceutical companies collect in the United States encourage them to do lots of research and development in the hope of earning more of those sweet, sweet returns. Again, nope. more of a fucking unbearably tweet. Right? You're writing. He writes like a fucking high schooler. Does she have any editors who are like, "This isn't cute or funny, Megan. It's actually grotesque." And it's really good in there. She says encourages them. Those sweet, sweet returns. And wait, one more sentence. The rest of the world essentially free rides on Americans' willingness to pay more. Okay. Willingness to so, pay. So yeah, more, yeah, our it. willingness to pay. No, nobody nobody asked us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If if given the choice, we would actually like to pay less, and that's what this article yeah. you're trying to ar- argue, you're trying to talk us out of. Yeah. In Megan's ideal world, we all would be willing to pay as oh, yeah, whatever because, prescription like, drugs. Those hardworking uh pharmaceutical reps, they deserve every penny. Okay. What's so stunning about this? They gave me a slightly different type of fucking stat. Is Megan makes a shitload of money, right? I mean, I assume she has like a pretty good salary writing for the Washington oh, yeah, Post. Okay. Uh and like she gets money in exchange for her willingness to debase herself in public over and over again. What's stunning to me about this line about how uh, actually the American pharmaceutical industry, their, their profits subsidize medical research that the rest of the world free rides on is the oldest fucking line in like the health, the, the Pfizer fucking PR playbook. They've been pulling this for probably 20 years now and they're doing it again. They haven't changed this line at all. They, uh, their, their profits, oh, it's going all to research. They spend vastly more money on fucking marketing yep. and like stock buybacks. They spend it on They spend pens. it on marketing. They spend it on pens that have the names of the drugs on it and hand jobs for doctors so that they'll prescribe them. They like they, they spend a fraction of these profits on legitimate medical well, research. Says, and says, most of the actual important medical research that leads to breakthroughs are, are from government funded research. National Institute of Health. They then the, the, they get and then glom of, onto it because we have no at a time release mechanism and then patent it so no one can get yeah. that drug for the next hundred years yeah. because we don't have any mechanism to distribute drugs or or actually uh, to to develop and distribute drugs. We have to give the rate research to private companies just because they have a distribution network, which we could absolutely have that be a fucking public provision as well. If the okay, Megan continues here. And the thing she says, I just wanted to say it. She goes, it encourages them to put the money into research. Well, it's obviously not the case. Well, beyond that, it's like you're just you're just saying that. Like that's there's no support there. You're saying, well, logically it would. It's the same argument when they say, oh, you cut taxes on rich people, then they're gonna put it back into their companies in the form of investment, and that'll be more jobs. We know they don't do that. We know for a fact they don't do that, but it sounds like something you would do if you were in that position. So you think, yeah, you're right, they do that. But we know they don't do that because also her premise that their money comes from like the next big like life saving drug. No, their money comes from slight variations on existing drugs <laughs> and addicting the nation to opiates. Yes, um, and buying old patents and jacking up the fucking price. Yeah. this is what I mean. That like Megan, this is what you're taught with Megan and other fucking reptiles like her are taught at like the Koch brothers Institute for humane studies and these journalism programs to get you placed in somewhere like the Washington post. So you can just regurgitate these ludicrous like PR bromides from private industry. What you learn there is how to like anesthetize any sense of shame or feelings that like you're a bad person. Like this, I said, Megan gets paid to embarrass herself in public because she doesn't care what she didn't give a fuck what she says doesn't care at all what comes out of her mouth. She just knows that she has to do it. She's just thinking about that William Sonoma catalog. She's thinking about putting another fucking giga in her goddamn kitchen. So go, she goes on she here. She is a uh, Lydia Rodarte quail. <laughs> <laughs> she goes on here. If the United States enacted European-style price controls on drugs, less of that research would be done. 
and that would mean real losses to human welfare. In recent years, drug companies have offered, among other things, a cure for hepatitis C, a treatment for drug-resistant epilepsy, a near-miraculous remission rates for previously terminal cancers. Okay, oh, they've, they, they invented all those things? Good, let's make it public domain and have it so that everyone can have access to these new wonderful life-saving drugs and And once again, I want to see the fucking work on where the goddamn research for these comes from because just because Pfizer patents it or or... or sells it to you or puts a commercial out does not mean that they did the fucking research that made that happen. She goes, the argument is a familiar one, though, and advocates for some form of price controls already have rejoinders. Probably the most frequently heard is that drug companies can keep research investment high by cutting in other areas, such as marketing dividends and stock buybacks, and boo-hoo if the shareholders don't like it. The adv- Again, that's literally what I just said. So she says, the advocate's solution is simple, appealing, and wrong. It fundamentally misunderstands the nature of drug pri- the drug pricing issue, which is not a budget problem, but an investment problem. A budget problem is what it sounds like. It's how you match outflow to inflow. If your salary drops by a third, you start cutting expenses until you've eliminated the deficit. Farewell vacation, and it may come time to sell one of those cars. But the investments... Are, but investments are about how you make your income grow. Imagine that you're deciding whether to go into business for yourself. It doesn't really matter what sort of business, but since Tuesday was National Roast Leg of Lamb Day, let's say you want to open a sheep farm. I don't know what the fuck she's talking about here. Here's a, here's a good thing. Uh, you, you start with a simple, defensible moral principle, which is that no one should die in the richest nation on earth because they can't afford insulin, a drug that's been extant for 70 years yeah. now. To create an argument, to, re- to like sort of reverse engineer an argument against that, you have to come up with this convoluted thought experiment where you're investing in lamb futures because it's <laughs> roast leg of lamb day, or you're comparing it to a household budget where you're like, oh, oh, if drug companies you know cut back on marketing, then uh, you know if you think about that like uh, your family, that means that uh, you won't be taking a vacation. What the fuck is she talking about? <laughs> well, it's like uh, the classic Felix tweet where you start page one of an economics textbook is. Uh, uh, the economy is why we have ice cream. Page 10, 50 is, and that's why it's okay that people die in factories. I just, uh, I'm very proud that uh, Bloomberg, or Washington Post, sorry, I forgot she's no longer. Yeah, she's Bloomberg. upgraded. Yeah. Washington Post has hired Dr. William Gull. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, prescription drug prices. It was uh, was it. It was the Jews who were the ones who yeah, were the Jews were not uh, <laughs> well, not, not be blamed for nothing. Yeah, yeah. but uh, no, she's just le- she's le- she's like leading a trail of breadcrumbs into the enchanted forest, so you could just get lost there forever. And be like, well, yeah, the like, if I want to get a lamb farm, okay, and then what? If, but what if? Oh, yeah. What about that extra? Uh, what about the car payment? And and by the end of it, you just don't even know what your name is. But, so she you know, like she goes on here. She says. Uh, do you still open the sheep farm? <laughs> Shut up! Shut you can you up. can cut the budget and maybe still eke out a living. Oh god! When you're making a new oh, investment, I'm gonna I, I'm reading this whole thing. Oh, oh, I'm reading this whole thing. You could cut the budget and maybe still eke out a living. But when you're making a new investment, the question isn't how can I make my income match my expenses, but is the is this the best use of my time and money? Most of us want to do more than eke out a living. If government squeezes the profit out of a business, we're not going to go into that business. We'll do something else. That's how pharmaceutical firms think about research and development, not as something they must do, which they will support by economizing elsewhere, but as something they would like to do if the investment pays better than doing something else, such as executing stock buybacks. It's also how people buying, how people buying biotech stocks or lending money to pharmaceutical firms think about their activities. And so if the returns on those investments are squeezed, fewer investments will be made. It's almost like the fucking profit motive is in direct conflict with human welfare. How about we just um, nationalize all pharmaceutical firms and run them as public concerns? Oh, wait a minute. No, no, because you need the only thing that makes people develop new medicines is profit motive. Those those scientists in those labs at the National Institute of Health, they've got dollar signs in their head, which is, of course, why fucking Cuba, which has a totally nationalized healthcare system and is also an impoverished island under fucking economic embargo for 60 years, Cured cancer and or cured AIDS and fetuses, and has a fucking a, a cancer vaccine. They were able to pull this shit together without having an industry that depends on like taking a bunch of fucking uh, like general practitioners from Omaha, taking about the steak dinners, and then giving them all uh, lap dances at scores. Okay, I hear what you're saying, and it is a valid point. But imagine, if you will, it was enchilada night at your house, <laughs> but someone. Uh, made a little oopsie daisy and forgot to buy the soft taco shells. Now you could make it with hard taco shells, but if my husband, who hasn't made eye contact with me in six months, 
uh, he forgot where I put my $35,000 tortilla maker. <laughs> then I just have to completely pointlessly meander through life at the behest of the Bohemian Grove and reptilians. And then I just die a pointless existence, having never really been loved or loved anyone. And uh, then you can't get your enchiladas. Uh, but there's a no. There's a fundamental conflict. Like she's framing this of it has the profit motive is what gives people the incentive to to do life saving work. And in what and, I, and we've already pointed out that that's not necessarily true. The Cuban healthcare system comes out well, with amazing life saving innovations the, the guy, the guy, on a shoestring fucking budget with no profit. Who's motive. It, the guy who created the polio vaccine? He gave it away. Copyright on it because he, he gave said, it away. Like, the guy who synthesized insulin too also yeah. gave it away. He didn't say I want one day for the disgusting slug daughter of Joe Manchin to be able to buy sixteen fucking uh, uh, below ground pools on a on a recently uh, mountaintop removed hill in fucking West Virginia. But I think a good example that is even more uh, trenchant to how there's just this is a fundamentally incorrect argument. This idea that 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 uh, that profit is what is going to is what saves lives in medical in the medical world is people might know this or not, but we are on the verge of getting a epidemic of uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria that could like dec decimate the human population because we have because uh, bacteria have over the last couple of generations grown increasing resistant to existing uh, antibiotics. Antibiotics are becoming less and less effective at stopping infections. We talked about this with Lee Phillips. It basically means that like not only are most medical like surgeries would be impossible without antibiotics, but like very simple things like like catheters would yeah. also be impossible without antibiotics. And the pharmaceutical industry is not doing anything about it because there's no money in it. Nope. So this is a case where the la the profit motive is literally incentivizing apocalypse. Apocalypse, yes. Well, it's incentivizing us allowing everyone to die of antibiotic resistant, re antibiotic resistant bacteria. Looks like guys who don't swiffer their floor are looking pretty smart right now. <laughs> Last paragraph. Oh, thank God. There's a reasonable argument, of course, that Americans should be willing to forsake pharmaceutical research to make current drugs more affordable. But before going that route... Everyone needs to be clear on what sort of decision is being made. Otherwise, it's all too likely that cutting drug prices now in the name of easing people's budgets will mean later discovering that we inadvertently sacrifice the life-saving investments of the future. Okay, for, well, we've talked about why that's bullshit and why her premise is wrong, but right there where she says, what does she say? We're doing it in the name of, of what about the budgets? Otherwise, it's all too likely that cutting drug prices now in the name of easing people's budgets. That's it. There you go. That's, that's what helped. That's what... Uh, Prescription drug prices mean to to Megan McArdle. Oh, I might have to not get that uh, that rice enema machine that I was going to get <laughs> uh, instead of literal life or death for millions of people, which we know for a fact it is. How how many fucking times have you seen a story about somebody who rations their fucking insulin until they die because they haven't been getting consistent treatment for their diabetes? That happens all the fucking time, and people never even get prescriptions filled that they have been. Uh, prescribed for them because they can't afford it and then they die. We know that people are literally dying over this. It's not about whether or not you're going to... Uh, and, and, she, and, and, and she tips her hand too when she says, well, it's like a household budget. If you cut here, you might not be able to take that vacation or you might have to sell that second car. Just that's her baseline. As somebody who's going to fucking... Uh, to going to Aspen and has three cars in the fucking garage and, and whose who's, uh, household budget is just, uh, just this vast array of, of expenses that she can slowly winnow down in the case of an economic downturn instead of what it is for most people which is a fucking razor's edge of life and death and a thing like uh a a spike in in the cost of a uh of a prescription uh is why you die it's why you die Again, or it's why you 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 can't do something else that's vastly important to your life and that leaves you completely fucked somewhere else I mean, again, like the question that's being posed is not one about budgets is, you know, if if you like have X, like how much money would you pay to keep living? How much money would you keep pay? What would you pay to keep your foot? Like how much money would you pay like to, you know, have a livable quality of life? This is the question that our health insurance, the health insurance and prescription drugs in America in a privatized system asks people every day to Megan, because I don't think she's like. I don't know, a human being? Not really. I don't know, not really a human. She's a really like, strong argument for the uh, David Icke theory. Yeah. 
Uh, to her, that's a reasonable question and that you could create a graph actually that could chart out like where your sweet spot is between like uh, living, living a decent life, living a life that's brutally, um, you know, pre- you know, prescribed by a chronic illness that, that would otherwise be treatable. But, you know, also you want that, you know, jet ski or whatever. She probably has like, you know, formulas and graphs that she thinks represent like a logical way to figure this out. But at the end of the day, she knows this is all bullshit, but she knows it's her job to write it and put her name on it and they just want they, they just want real estate in the newspaper where someone will it's say arguing on their behalf. well someone will just say you know hey affordable drugs that you know save your life or the lives of people you know and love that might sound good but what if it weren't yeah and the thing is is that and whenever she's doing this she's invoking a real argument and, and, she, and it is a kind of a straw man thing and I, I think she could argue well when you talk about the way people talk about things they really only emphasize the positives and not the trade-offs. It's like, yeah, that's what literally everyone does in politics. You're acting like that's some sort of cheating demagoguery when leftists do it. Literally everyone fucking does that. But yes, of course there are fucking cost-benefit. Of course there's, uh, there's a trade-offs. There have to be for everything. But her assumption is whatever we do, the, the trade-offs, they're all in the context where there are these disgusting, fat, blood-filled tick parasites who are sucking off everyone else so that their kids can go to clown college, their profits are are in, are cannot, are sacrosanct. Like whatever 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 we're doing in terms of trading off a, a bloated, disgusting corporate sector of 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 pro- capitalist profiteers that's built in that can't go anywhere. Like Joe Manchin shithead daughter, all the Sacklers they they have to be kept whole. They cannot lose their standard of living. They cannot lose their fifteenth yacht. Not even their standard of living. They can't even take a minor haircut. Nothing. Nothing. They can't lose anything. Yeah. Uh, and that I just think that that's a very faulty assumption to say the least. And it's funny how she doesn't, and she never really puts it that way, of course, because nobody would accept it. But like, look at that article. She's talking about the incentive to produce. Well, what's what's who makes the money? It's not the guys who make the fucking disease changing drugs. It's the guys who sell them. It's the fucking companies that sell them that make the money. The 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 people who actually do the life saving research. They cannot be motivated by the thought of, oh, my God, I'm going to be a billionaire because they never become billionaires. Their fucking bosses do. And like so much of like like economic theory, like the way I mean, like like when I say Megan isn't human, I would say like most of the economics profession, like as a discipline is also deeply inhuman in that it like it's this weird overlap of like evolutionary biology where they assume individual human beings are these like just rational computing machines that are always making decisions based on their like genetic outcome. And they generally don't think they think like altruism generally doesn't exist or it only extends so far as like your immediate blood group and that everyone is capable of making these choices like, like a computer, yeah. like nodes and kind of an algorithm, which just based on any human experience outside of the realm of economics is untrue. Yes. And, and the thing, and here's the thing, economics creates that world. Yeah by which we literally are all competing with one another to fucking like i that you know like my getting prescription drugs comes at the uh expense of everyone else or like like things like that where it makes this robotic inhuman world it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy and and here's the other way that you know it's bullshit the assumption there is everyone is motivated by personal interest and not even that specifically financial capitalist interest. financial interest investment and that's why people create life-saving drugs. Well, as we've said, the people who actually create life-saving drugs are scientists and doctors. And I, and they, I could say ca- categorically, they are not motivated by becoming billionaires. Why? Because they became scientists instead of becoming pharmaceutical executives. If they cared about money, they wouldn't have that job. They would have the job in the fucking C-suites. So clearly there are people in the world who want to help other people. And, that, and, and the capitalism exists it's supposed to be the thing that directs um, directs resources, right? Like efficiently. That's mm-hmm. the argument of capitalism. Yeah. It's the most efficient way to direct resources. And that might have some validity in certain like consumer markets, but in something as, as vital and, and uh, uh, as and inelastic as fucking healthcare and, and medicine, it's simply not true. We know where the resources should go. We know what we need to do. And we have people who want to work on those things. We could just direct the money that way. We do not need this parasitic class directing the money in a way that guarantees that they are always uh, compensated and that people, because of that, die because you create the artificial scarcity of price, uh, in price points, elevated price points, to, to limit the number of people who can access the drug. I would say at the end of the day, economics like as a discipline is largely 
created and maintained by people who hate humanity. Mm -hmm. They have a fundamental contempt for human beings or humanity as a concept. And like they wish to exist only as individuals in competition, ruthless competition with everyone else. And they cannot conceive of a world in which that is not the case. And they are in, in fact creating one in which it is. So Megan McArdle, once again, probably the greatest all-star in Chapo history. <laughs> Campus security was not called, unlike the Grenfell episode. But, you know, we're, we've got chiller vibes now. We're on the Mary Ann. Yeah, so. exactly. Ever since Mary Ann came into my life, I just can't get as angry as I used to. She's so smart, man. I love her I so love much. Her. Uh, I would break A for her. I, I would absolutely. Uh, <laughs> I want her to slam her cheeks in my face and like break my nose. Jesus. <laughs> uh, to begin with, though, I, I should I should point out that like I should preface this by saying uh, Megan uh, started out by talking about how uh, her her elder her own elderly father has been. Um, ejected from his like nursing home without any testing and that like mm. he like is has the, has had the coronavirus or something and the nursing home isn't telling what, him. like he was bounced uh, like he was feeling people up and got thrown right. out he, he got 86 <laughs> <laughs> shit hold on sir 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 you've uh, you played too much ska on the jukebox <laughs> right, i know so here here's the context she says I, at elevated risk for dying of COVID, am now locked into a house with a COVID positive patient because his, <laughs> because his nursing home discharged him without retesting. If you are among those who keep saying the risk of COVID is low, I invite you over to I invite you to come over. We need help moving furniture. Uh, please take care of my father. Someone please. <laughs> I can't say it so I mean I I, I you know, obviously that's a tough situation to be in for Megan, but I'm sort of surprised that she isn't coming at this with her usual sort of like uh, contrarian, askew glance at the world, which is like at one level, it's like, yeah, it seems like that nursing home is behaving irresponsibly. But, you know, I mean, they have responsibilities to the shareholders of the nursing cor home <laughs> corporation. And like, would she prefer that there just not be nursing homes? Maybe like, she's if, looking if, at it from the wrong angle. I mean, like, could he operate like a, a KitchenAid? Is there a way that he could, like, use all of her kitchen gadgets? Maybe he'd be more valuable on the streets, you know? He could get a broom, start start sweeping up some of the garbage out there. You know, you know? Yeah. And also, like, you know, I mean, obviously a lot of people are, are, are dying of uh, coronavirus. But, like, be, you know, I take Megan seriously. So, like, I know for a fact that maybe we shouldn't. The risk is actually low because there's a good chance they could have died of, you know, anything else independent of the coronavirus. Like, if it never happened... Like, who, you know, they could have got hit by a car, stung by a, you know, hornet's nest. Like, yeah, point, oh, poisons. no, we have a massive outbreak of botulism. Or like some <laughs> yeah. 1900s disease. Poisoned by I'm just daughter. saying, like, look, we don't know anything. It's very and then like in this in this crazy mixed up world, it's often very hard to tell what is right and what is wrong. And, <laughs> and you know, so I'm just saying I'm, I'm, I'm a little surprised Megan is taking this tack. But I'm more surprised with the tack she takes here where she shares this thought. This is not a scientific assessment, just an idle speculation. I'm glad she prefaces. <laughs> I'm glad she uses that uh, hmm. qualifier to to bring this up. She's, she's just she's just spinning her wheels, you know. Yeah. She's just blasting she goes, you out. So you there's, no, there's no bad bad ideas in brainstorming. <laughs> don't don't keep yourself down, Queen. You are a genius. Please. She is. DM I feel. Me. I feel about her like I feel like about like guys feel about Mariah Carey now like <laughs> compared to like, following <laughs> go on go on like follow dude following right. following fucking the zero quality uh Zeke Emanuel with it like she's I love her because she's never succeeded at anything yeah. she sucks at everything like even like her marriage like sucks <laughs> but she's like every day every day she goes out there and she's like ah. Oh! What yeah? What if uh? What if the thing killing people with coronavirus was that? What was that? Um, they were cursed by a wizard. <laughs> he's writing her articles. I love her. She this goes, is like she's like the non-practicing Catholic version of the Iman uh, the Emmanuels. Like, yes, like, that transposed into like, oh, you learned about Jesus or whatever in, in grade school, and then like never followed up. Yeah, so so good. So she goes here. You know, pl please take uh, please take it in that light the light of idle speculation. But she says here, 
looking at all the infections at choir practice, soccer games, restaurants, etc., what if one big problem is noise? <laughs> this would also help explain love her. why NYC happened so fast. Okay. Continuing. Interesting. Would like to know more. <laughs> And she says here, as I say, this is completely idle speculation. I am just noodling what policy recommendations might come out of a discovery that noise spreads COVID. Do we redesign restaurants to be like those 1950s places with drapery everywhere instead of cool industrial vibe? Does noise pollution become a bigger priority? And then she says, sorry, to be clear, noise is a problem because when it is noisy, people raise their voices to be heard which facilitates droplet transmission. I'm not suggesting that, like, noise gives you COVID. She's like, do we invest billions into tin cans connected by a string? <laughs> Place them at every table <laughs> and restaurants. That people can- <laughs> I lo- this is why I love her, is because, like, she's one of the, like, most articles we read, it's just, like, no one's even fucking trying. They're just, like, they're just droning along on the keyboard until they get their paycheck. But McArdle is special. But uh, so like the, a I couple of people her. tried to test this theory here and she had answers for everything. Um, I like, though, that, that <laughs> by the way, I, she always does. one of the things that I really like about this is that she continually tries to bring whatever is going on into her wheelhouse. Like mm-hmm. she has kind of an inductive reasoning way of thinking where she's like, look, I don't I'm not like a medical science person, but you know what? Curtains. What about curtains? <laughs> <laughs> well, and it, 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 if, it, if curtains are the solution, maybe I'm the girl to write a column about it. Yeah. And again, just like with all these people, like with, you know, Larry Summers or the scientist who wants people to die at, at 75, go ahead. Be the first one, Megan. Shut the fuck up. Never yeah. never talk again. Like, just go for it, please. Yeah. To, to Even, a woman yeah. with a crate and barrel catalog, it, like every problem just requires curtains. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Megan, do not listen to him. You're a fucking queen. Don't try to fit. Don't try to fit in a world where you were born to stand out. I love you. So, uh, uh, like I said, like a, a few people um, uh, tested this theorem here, and uh, the the first one is I love this an account an account just titled Marketplace Fairness. Uh, yes. Says, yes. It says that's um, my alt. Sorry. It says uh, <laughs> you have so many. <laughs> they say here. Uh, Nursing homes aren't exactly raucous, noisy places. I'd probably delete this one. Uh, she, but you know what? Like they, like they, they didn't attack. Counterattack. <laughs> senior citizens, how, senior citizens, however, are often hard of hearing, so people stand close to them and talk real loud. Boom. Bra, hold Bra, gra, ta, ta, ta. Yeah. This is clap back. Ether. Clap, clap back of the years. She's, sp- you know, sis spilled. I get now why Felix loves her. Any time you point out that, that Felix K-pop. says something, that Felix says something ridiculous, he is able to argue how it is. How like, well, trains are a kind of architecture. Like, this is <laughs> this is Megan has the same thing. She's she, she's got that touche energy where yeah. she's just you know she needs to like join the circus or something. Like, I, I really just feel like like her talents are just like being <laughs> being wasted. She's you know? really good at thinking on her feet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love her. So here, here's the here's the here's the best one though. Like, I, I thought like, so, so. Another guy says. Uh, but funerals are also <laughs> big letters, and they are quiet and solemn. Good point. Let's see. The, let's hear the repast. Depends on the culture. The funeral oh, itself so, yes. the funeral it, like shivers. <laughs> <laughs> the funeral itself may be solemn, or there may be a lot of singing, etc. And the after party can be very crowded, social, etc. This is Megan doing oh, anti-Irish bigotry. She is against <laughs> Irish wakes. She's mm-hmm. trying to say that getting drunk and spitting whiskey into your uncle's mouth is <laughs> some kind of super spreader behavior. And I, I would really appreciate it if she deleted that one cheat. Yo, we got to deplatform yeah. her. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and also, I, I, I like the it could noise be the killer it's i have so to credit insane. i have to credit jacob Bacharach with this one but uh uh she has reverse engineered the uh the probably the least successful uh david lynch alteration to the dune narrative which of course <laughs> is the invention of the uh the killing word and the uh the the weirding way or the the yes yeah when, when, when megan was a child her mom came into her room with a typewriter no woman born child has ever written an article this shitty. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So there you Show. go. Uh, you know, just stop, stop washing your hands, but like, but please whisper in public, you know, mm-hmm. if we're going to get on top of this thing, let's just uh, use your, use your library voice. people. Uh, before we wrap things up today, we did want to um, check in with you. Uh, you know, we've been talking about the, the merging of sports morons and political morons. And this is the perfect topic, the perfect author. What did you know it? Friend of the show, Megan McArdle, registered a take in the Washington Post called A Defense of Roger Goodell mm-hmm. that, you know, I would be remiss without getting your thoughts on. I'd so. I, I just like to point out that this she actually plagiarized that for me. I wrote an article <laughs> in defense of Roger Goodell like four years ago. So just from the get-go, I, well, I like it a lot because it's my own take that she's recycling. I um, haven't read this. Uh, I'm going to just make a shot in the dark guess. Does she start off by saying, bear in mind, I don't watch football or know anything about sports, but it seems to me that this is how things should go. Not quite. Because I can't believe she's a football fan. I mean, maybe she is. I don't know. I don't know what any of these ghouls like. I mean, when I think of Megan McArdle, I honestly just imagine her standing stock still in her incredibly well-appointed kitchen, just staring at the wall. All right. Let's let, 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 sorry, let's dive into uh, to McArdle's uh, oh, defense yes. of Roger Goodell. So she begins by writing, whatever you think of Roger Goodell, commissioner of the National Football League, you should recognize that he's trying to solve a genuinely hard problem or rather two hard problems. On one hand, he's trying to maximize the audience for NFL games. At the same time, he's also trying to negotiate the same fraught racial politics that our nation has been struggling with for centuries, but in miniature and in prime time. Mm -hmm. So those are the two problems he's trying to solve. Uh, Nearly 70% of NFL players are black. Why wouldn't those players want to use their privileged position to highlight one of the most pressing problems facing their community today? But the last time the Nielsen Year in Sports report broke down the numbers in 2013, football viewership was 15% black, but 77% white. Only 35% of whites are sympathetic to the Black Lives Matter movement, which seems a reasonable proxy for their sympathy for the kind of in-your-face protests that refusing to stand for the national anthem represents. It's totally in my face! I do like how... In any one of these, in any situation where 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 Megan feels the need to comment, what what compels her to comment is her instinctive sympathy for someone in an absurd position of power. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's yeah. the yeah, only yeah. thing she cares yeah. about. So she no, but she says here, let's you, she says here, let's be clear, whites should be more sympathetic to the problem of racial inequities in the criminal justice system. If cops treated whites the way they treat blacks, white people would not be arguing that crime is the real problem and that profiling is just statistics. Of course, Megan has argued that on numerous occasions herself. Uh, They'd be frantically calling for legislators and muttering about the Second Amendment. But few human beings of any color are as keenly alive to the suffering of others as they are to their own travails. So however desirable, it seems unlikely that white America en masse will suddenly muster towering outrage about the problem that doesn't about a problem that doesn't much affect them, not even if they see athletes protesting it on national television. So she's sort of like she's describing like a, a real moral and political schism in American culture. But as usual, in Megan's inimitable way, she finds a way to like describe both sides of it in the most banal way possible without yep. ever really getting to the heart of. Yeah. She just sort of like just states both sides, doesn't really say anything about either of them. Yeah. It seems her take is just uh, I you may not agree with what Roger Goodell says, but I will defend to death his yeah. right to say it. <laughs> yeah. His right yeah. to fuck it up as much as possible. And yeah, I, there there's really no take that she has coming out of it. But I think that there is an elegant solution that the NFL could employ, which is like let's skip past this first amendment bullshit and let's just say um let's bring back the third amendment and <laughs> you should be allowed to kneel for the anthem. If you quarter a troop, <laughs> and you're, and you're, you, have yeah. to, you have to room and board with a troop uh, for that week, and then you have permission to kneel. So she describes that uh, you know NFL viewership is down 17% since 2015, which, as you've pointed out, is just all t- TV ratings are down that same. Also, right. football is bad now. Football games are hard to watch because they've done all these ch- rule changes, and it's they take forever. It just seems to me that they're more boring than they used to. Oh, Matt, you're right, though. She goes, attendance and public perception about the NFL are also hurting. There's a robust debate over whether the protests are contributing to the decline, but we'll sidestep that since I know little about the sport and the opinions of people who do know something there we go. Go largely off. seem to be conveniently correlated with their opinions about the protests. There we go. So, again, she's never ever going to say, you know, 
whether it's right or wrong, whether whether an athlete should be able to kneel for the national anthem and not have their job threatened yeah. or with, white supremacy. Yeah. Opinions differ. Yeah. So she goes, um, the decline of football may be inevitable, but even so, it's probably a bit much to expect an NFL commissioner to say, I guess we're doomed and seek meaning in the impending death by sending the league on, quote, a suicide charge against racial inequality. <laughs> <laughs> that it just literally they were wearing detonation vests and killing the cops that were protecting them. It's unbelievable. And she, she you know, she goes, I'm not going to read all of this, but she goes, the solution that the league's owners actually chose was the kind of mushy compromise America used to specialize in, designed to please no one but satisfy everyone. That and Mar- McCardle believes that is like the height of oh, yeah. morality. But uh, she goes here, which encapsulates another problem that this country is struggling to solve. The burgeoning politicization of every facet of American life. And not just the vague patriotism of playing the national anthem at sporting events, but the specific political vision of one of our nation's two warring tribes. And then she just goes into uh, talking about tribalism. We live in a society. Thank you, Megan. Everyone's in a tribe except Megan. She goes, there's a deeper and arguably more important objection. A healthy society needs to foster spaces where we forget about our political divisions and unite over something else. Without those spaces, we don't have the common reservoir of goodwill, of shared identity, from which durable political change must ultimately be forged. So what she's saying here is uh, NFL players or any black person concerned about the way the cops treat them, you're going to have to take the L on this one, at least as far as football goes. Because yeah. it's, a, it's a space that we all need to come together in. And as you said, Matt, if they really wanted to be apolitical, how about just cut out the fucking national anthem? Yeah. How about we don't have a fucking caravan of Bradley fighting vehicles doing donuts in the fucking field before the game? Don't you take away my flyover. <laughs> don't you do it. I mean, like most entertainment that people consume is devoid of politics. Like, yeah. that's the dumbest thing about this take. Like, if you broke it down by age, like, you would find... By my rough estimate, there's about like two million, maybe probably less than that people in all combined American media markets who want to consume like cable news all the time. But the rest of it, which is like Jake Paul, uh, professional Overwatch, uh, Takeshi Six Nine, these are all apolitical things. Whatever like network show people like that's called like, you know, the nanny's wife or whatever the fuck people like. <laughs> it's all totally apolitical. It just it is taking a belt sound out of your brain. You feel very nice. Nothing. Most people don't care about politics. Most people don't vote. Uh, well, well, what Megan is doing here is creating equivalency between uh, Kaepernick or any politically act- active African-American athlete who wants to use their platform to uh, highlight the you know, injustices in America's judicial and you know, policing and someone who gets insanely mad because for 10 seconds at the beginning of their of their you know weekly uh wing and beer fest they have to look at someone who disagrees with yeah. them like she's saying like that, that that is like equally intolerant or like that's equal uh hostility sort of hostility you're yeah. being hostile to the fucking corn-fed rube racists said, yeah. who make up the nfl fan base she says most people don't want to immerse ourselves in politics 24 7 in fact most people it's- can't stand it but like she's saying like it, it's 10 seconds, it's ten five seconds. seconds. And you know, most people never watched it before this. People had, and Kaepernick was doing it for a while and nobody even noticed. Right. At, at first he was like sitting on the sidelines. And yeah. He wasn't even kneeling. And then I guess he talked to maybe Nate Boyer or uh, one, of the, one of the former military guys that was in the NFL. And they said, hey, how about you kneel? And so now he kneels like out of, from, it's a recommendation from a real live actual troop that said, hey, just kneel. That's not disrespectful. And so now he kneels. But now that's a bigger problem. Well, because it's anything that questions the order is disrespectful because it's a threat. You're threatening my man cave. You're threatening the sanctity of my fucking meat neck existence. And therefore, I'm violently angry at you. But what the NFL is dealing with, really, and if she wasn't a pinhead, she'd recognize this, is it's the it's the double edged sword of monopoly. This is the same thing that that Facebook is dealing with. And Twitter is that is that the idea that, well, you know. People can do what they want. Uh, it doesn't hold sand if you are a hegemonic thing. Like Facebook is essentially a monopoly, right? And 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 in terms of sports, when you talk about like the most popular sport, it is NFL by a vast, vast amount. And there's no other football leagues 
You know, they have they have an anti-monopoly exemption that allows them to be this absolute market bestriding colossus. And what that does is then you've created a, a totality where people want to feel represented because they have nowhere else to go. Like if they're on Facebook, there's no alternative to Facebook. If they want to watch football, there's no alternative to the NFL. So everyone needs to feel like they're being represented in it. Hey, Vince McMahon, where are you? Oh, well, yeah, you. the XFL 2020. Yeah. See, they're talking about that. And who is going to bring it back as like the troop football troop alternative. League, yeah. And that's going to be awesome. Like, uh, yeah, like landmines so, so that will blow up if you kneel on the, on, the, on the field during the national anthem, that kind of thing. Uh, uh, every half you have uh, the national anthem. Uh, actually, no, after every touchdown, you have the national anthem. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, that's, and then that, that, if the, we had that situation and there were a bunch of different NF footballs, you could be more loosey-goosey about it. But the NFL is this totality, so people want to feel like they are part of it, you know? Yeah. And, the same, and, and that's like, this is the fucking bed you made, NFL, by being yeah. America's sport. And this is like... M- We're all miserable m- shitheads who hate each other. That's part of being America. And what, America. I, what I like about this piece is that McCardell, of course, cops do not understanding anything about sports or football. That's another standard move of her. If she's opining on a topic, she'll always make sure yeah. to qualify by saying, yeah. I know nothing of what I'm talking about. She always about. buries in every article uh, yeah. a caveat, you shouldn't have read this. So she, she, like, doesn't, she doesn't understand sports or She doesn't follow football. She certainly doesn't understand... Uh, anyone who's upset about cops killing people only in the most only in the only most, in the most passionate yeah. hypothetical uh, she certainly doesn't understand that way. but what she does understand is the position roger goodell is in which yes. is being a f- like sort of front man for like a series of ol- like unaccountable oligarchs yes and their billion dollar industry that literally grinds the lives of black people into a uh, grist and you know, money for them. Yeah, it turns their brains into soup. So the, the thesis for this article is, hey, just knock it off with Roger Goodell. He's, you know, he sucks. He makes bad decisions, but you shouldn't be mean to people. He's doing his best. Yeah. Literally. Literally she, and he actually, best. Roger Goodell is doing his best. The problem is that his best is really, really fucking bad. <laughs> Roger Goodell is like, he's not a lawyer, and he'll be quick to remind you that he's not a lawyer, <laughs> which may, it means that he can get away with saying a lot of shit that a lawyer would get in trouble for saying. And his other technique, besides like this convoluted legal mumbo jumbo that he puts out, is to just issue statements that are so boring that you fall asleep after the second sentence. A, a typical Roger Goodell statement will be, uh, the NFL is certainly observing uh, and taking in all sides of this issue, and we are implementing uh, certain protocols for pregame behavior that will ensure a continued success for game day experience for all of our fans. And it's like you just want to fucking die, and you don't you don't care what else he says at the end of that statement. He could like you know throw in Mein Kampf in the second paragraph, <laughs> and nobody would ever get to it. Maybe that's that should be the true compromise. Like if Megan was more competent, she would rec- recognize their compromise is not meeting somewhere in the middle, probably like closer to the right. It's taking all extremes. And what you could do is you start out the game with Roger Goodell saying, you know, that corporate statement speak, we're taking in all sides of this. We're trying to create the optimal experience, blah, blah, blah. Then boom, national anthem, everyone stands. But then one troop is killed, but the troop is Bo Bergdahl. (laughs) And everyone is happy. Everyone gets to do the thing that they like. Fans of Roger Goodell, of which there are many, get to experience him, and he gets to level the playing field. Fans of the anthem get to experience that. Uh, f- enemies of American Empire get to enjoy something, but it's not. It's they're not taking away yeah. of anything from the right wing people. They hate Bo Bergdahl. Megan and we Mc- can keep finding deserters. What no? Th- what this article is is Megan is actually she doesn't like sports, doesn't really like art or culture of any kind. Uh, outside of you know cooking recipes and things like that, I don't but know she, anyone like that. But she, <laughs> but she, uh, she, she is a fan of Goodell because she's a fan of bloodless, soulless flax yeah. for corporations and billionaires, which is what she is. That's how she got her start. That is an in aw- the Koch Brothers Institute for Humane Studies. That is an awesome type of person. Just like I don't really like the games; it's kind of boring. But Roger Goodell, he just. Just really, he just knocks it out of the park so every she, time. Sorry, just, I'm just, just a fan of leadership. You yeah. know? She, she closes here saying, uh, <laughs> fervently supporting free speech doesn't necessarily imply that everyone should have to listen to that speech every waking moment, which is why you can support what the athletes are kneeling for and their right to speak forcefully for their opinions without retaliation or censure 
and yet still recognize the wisdom of a Goodell-style compromise <laughs> that leaves Americans at least a few arenas where they only have to root for one team at a time. Oh, Roger, uh, you left it by the way without, without, the without retaliation or censor. Like Kaepernick still doesn't have a job in the NFL because the owners literally colluded to keep him yes. from one yes. and yes. or even a sponsorship deal. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, so Roger Goodell, Player of the Year, though. He left it all at the field to keep the NFL apolitical. He's a real blue collar commissioner. <laughs> he, he just <laughs> so shows, he up shows up there. He comes to commission every day. He's the first guy in his office, <laughs> last guy to leave his office every day. Real ham and eggs type of commissioner. <laughs> yeah, he's not one of those showboats and that you'd get in other leagues. Guys like Bud Selig, like flashy, sexy players like Bart Giamatti, Bar- yeah. <laughs> Kennesaw Mountain Landis. <laughs> well, uh, I think that about does it. For this week, uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us. Thank you so much for letting yeah. us share our takes with you, sir. Yeah, it it's been fun. a pleasure. It Cheers, awesome. everybody. Bye-bye. Until oh, next time. We should, uh, I mean, I don't know why we're playing it because it's a significantly more successful show than ours, but part of my take on iTunes, Stitcher, check them out. Do you want, do you want me to plug your show on your show? For yeah, all my to listeners plug our that are listening. Yeah, yeah. To, okay, hey, check out Chapo Trap House and buy their fucking book. Thank you. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> I don't care if I never get back. Let me root, root, root for the home team. If they don't win, it's a shame. For it's one, two, 